All right, good morning. This is Senate Health and Welfare Committee. It is February 8th, and this morning we, um, we're continuing testimony on S206, which is an act relating uh, to the planning for care and treatment of patients with cognitive impairments. And we've asked uh, Rhonda Williams of the Department of Health uh, to come in and talk with us a little bit about what's going on there. And then Sean Londrigan, our long-term care ombudsman from Vermont Legal Aid, who is here. So thank you both for being with us. Um, and unless I hear differently from you, uh, why don't we just go in the order that you are on the agenda? And I know you've each sent some information to us and that's greatly appreciated. So thank you for getting this, the testimony up front. So uh, Rhonda, welcome. Uh, you haven't been in our committee before, so it's good to see you. Oh, good to see you too. Okay. And um, I'm Senator Ginny Lyons, chair of the committee. And with us uh, is Senator Ruth Hardy, vice chair of the committee. Senator Cheryl Hooker is here from Rutland. Senator Ann Cummings from Washington County and our clerk, Senator Joshua Terenzini, also of Rutland. So thanks for being here with us. Why don't you go ahead with your testimony on S206 and we welcome hearing from you. Great, well, thank you so much for having me. Uh, so Rhonda Williams, I'm with the Vermont Department of Health and in the Division of Health Promotion and Disease Prevention. So thank you for the committee's discussion on this important topic of addressing Alzheimer's disease and related dementias and healthy aging. The Health Department's Alzheimer's Disease and Healthy um, Aging Program, which administers the BOLD grant and for which I'm the principal investigator for, uh, aligns with the Health Department's mission uh, for protecting and promoting the best health for all Vermonters. So I'm really honored to, to be here with you to share some of our progress thus far. So the BOLD grant is intended to create an infrastructure to address dementia from a public health approach in collaboration with community partners and Vermonters with lived experience. VDH's efforts to address ADRD started several years ago and it's what Vermont's BOLD grant builds upon. Under Commissioner Levine and then Dale Commissioner Monica Hutt's leadership, in partnership with the Alzheimer's Association and members of the Governor's Commission on Alzheimer's Disease and Related Dimensions, referred to as ADRD, we started preparing for the work by participating in a brain health learning collaborative with the Association of State and Health Territorial Organizations. We uh, published a brief action brief or action plan, I should say, on Alzheimer's disease and healthy aging in 2018. And so this was a, um, our work to, in collaboration with Dale and the Alzheimer's Association and the Governor's Commission to have um, a concerted action plan um, for two years. We were also organizing learning sessions with offices of local health in the central office, including experiential learning on what it's like to have Alzheimer's. And we also hosted our first uh, public health grand rounds on research in dementia. We were responding to partners data requests. With funds from the National Office of the Alzheimer's Association, we set out to collect subjective cognitive decline um, and caregiver modules, in addition to brain injury and alcohol and medication misuse data. And facilitating an Alzheimer's and healthy aging work group with Dale and VDH colleagues. And that's one that I started facilitating several years ago, including colleagues in chronic disease, surveillance, substance use, and emergency response. These actions were instrumental, I think, in making our state a successful applicant to CDC's first competitive funding opportunity called BOLD, which stands for Building Our Largest Dementia Infrastructure. In May of 2020, we applied as a core state, which means that we weren't quite as far along as the enhanced state status. 
in the initial funding supplied by Congress to the CDC, just 16 states and territories were funded and another seven entities were added last year. The bold award to the Department of Health in the Division of Health Promotion and Disease Prevention, where I sit, started in September 2020 and awards 250,000 annually for three years. This grant is primarily a planning grant, although action is expected in hiring staff and performing data collection, surveillance, communications, partnership development, and education and training. This funding is intended to build a state's capacity to address Alzheimer's and brain health as an urgent public health issue. And using evidence-based strategies, there are 12, 25 of them, identified in the Healthy Brain Initiative, state and local partnerships to address uh, dementia roadmap, a very long title, but an important guidance document. And our program, so the BOLD program uses the roadmap strategies um, and strategies in our state health improvement plan uh, to address health inequities as, as it relates to um, older Vermonters. In these areas, I'd like to share several of the projects we're working on. In the area of health promotion, we are working with a contractor, HARC, uh, on communications to connect Vermonters to services and resources that can improve brain health. So last fall was our first brain health campaign, integrating brain health messages into My Healthy VT, which um, offers self-management classes to Vermonters, including uh, online uh, to respond to COVID. And the campaign was successful. We saw a very uh, strong response uh, to a small amount of funds. 31 of Vermonters registered for a diabetes prevention program um, from the digital promotion we did. So such promotion is vital. Only you know, less than half of Vermonters, 46%, report having discussed their memory concerns uh, with their doctor. So an important component of our work is to normalize the conversation and to reduce the stigma um, that's uh, associated with dementia. In the area of data collection, uh, in 2020, we were successful in starting a healthy aging data collection plan. Now, this is primarily focused in our behavioral risk factor surveillance system, which is um, conducted by the VDH. And our plan is to field every year um, the, cognitive, the subjective cognitive decline or the caregiver module, along with questions on sleep, substance misuse, um, hearing loss, brain injury, among several others that in totality help us to understand brain health among all Vermonters. And you can find our, our first data brief on risk factors for subjective cognitive decline, which I think I sent over, um, but it's also on our webpage. Oh, you did. It's, it's right there under risk factors for subjective cognitive decline. It's the second page of a two-pager. Great. Thank you. And in the area of evaluation, I just want to share that we also work with a contractor, um, that is uh, named Professional Data Analysts, and they're our contractor for um, our HIPTIP division. And with this contractor, PDA, we are engaging multiple stakeholders for creating a new action plan on Alzheimer's, related dementias, and healthy aging. We wanted to have an evaluator's neutrality to help Vermonters to feel comfortable with providing input in what they would like to see in a state plan. We've held over 10 engagement sessions that have included the Governor's Commission on ADRD, the AHS Abenaki Working Group, Areas Agency on Aging, and OLH, or Office of Local Health Chronic Disease designees, and also with um, organizations that represent low-income Vermonters. And so we are we, so that's one area of our evaluation. And the other area I just wanted to quickly mention 
question is that we are evaluating what you heard about last week, which is called the Hub and Spoke for ADRD um, project. VDH, Dale, and um, health uh, system partners are working to increase screening, early diagnosis, and care among primary care uh, with the intent so that even rural Vermonters can um, seek and, and receive treatment uh, from their local provider. So that, let me, yeah. can I ask you a quick question yeah, on certainly. that? So it's the hub and spoke are, mm -hmm. was obviously a community health team. Is this being embedded within blueprint or is it separate from? That's a great question. So last, just last week, we had our monthly meeting and Julie Parker from blueprint uh, was able to join us and I think is joining our work group meetings okay. uh, because we want to look more closely around what are the opportunities for uh, community health teams and blueprint, blueprint facilitators to play a role in that piece around the coordinated care. Um, and importantly, uh, so another, you know, another partner is SASH. And in performing the cognitive screen, very valuable. But when we have a failed test, how can we help assure that the PCP knows and that the PCP care team can and will take action to support that individual with further diagnostic um, care and treatment as needed? Thank you. Mm -hmm. And so um, just in terms of the last area, which is prevention. So CDC calls upon uh, states and other entities funded by the word, by the bowl to work with um, chronic disease and substance use prevention partners because lifestyle modifications that uh, benefit heart health, um, and that reduce risk for uh, many chronic diseases also protect and improve brain health. And that's a key area for us in uh, risk reduction is helping the public to understand that. And it can also help, I think, position chronic disease uh, management as well as prevention um, in, in a different light. So in summary, BOLD's objective is to address Alzheimer's and, health and uh, other dementias as a public health priority in collaboration with a diverse stakeholder uh, list. We need to have adequate data, communications, partnership, coordination, and evaluation capacity to uh, advance the effort and to address brain health inequities, and importantly, is to communicate the impact we're having. Our new state plan on Alzheimer's and healthy aging 2022 through 2024 will be shared broadly. Uh, we plan to publish uh, this spring and will guide our collaborative work. We intend this to be a living document open to changing and expanding with input and new resources. We will continue to look for funding including with the CDC, but also other funding sources as possible to address Alzheimer's disease, brain health and risk reduction as a public health priority in Vermont. So thank you again for your interest in this important issue and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, that is extremely helpful. It helps us understand what is going on now uh, with respect to Alzheimer's and uh, helps us to put it all together. So greatly appreciated. I, I do have a question um, and uh, I'm waiting for the airplane to go by so I can hear myself. Um, the, the question is this, you have an action plan that you're putting together. And so one of the things that we have been very concerned about in this committee is having sufficient uh, places for folks with cognitive impairment or Alzheimer's to, to go. So I know in my district, there's, I think, one, maybe two places where Alzheimer's patients uh, are taken care of. Uh, this goes outside of the home when they get to the stage of needing uh, external care, is, uh, institutional type of care. The, uh, what is in the action plan? What are you developing to build that 
infrastructure for these patients. Yeah, that's a that's a very important piece. Um, so, you know, I think important is that as an agency of human services, we look at the need at the data and at how to meet that need. I'm not certain that, you know, this action plan can answer that specifically, but what we are aiming to do in the short and longer term in a couple different ways. So through this specific action plan is importantly that we're raising awareness around the value of early detection. At the same time, we're increasing the capacity of primary care to do that. And why that's so important is that with early diagnosis, interventions can occur that include new medications, include you know, the, the value of nutrition and, and physical activity in emotional supports, um, just to mention a few, because the delay, so even if there is cognitive impairment, there may be other reasons for cognitive impairment. It may not be dementia, but if it does progress to dementia, there are um, known interventions that can make it so that staying in place in home can be longer and can be safer and with a higher quality of life. Um, there are several other plans underway, which you may have heard about. Um, those include the um, state plan on aging, as well as Act 156, the you know, state action plan on aging well. And so between um, Dale and the health department with um, the new advisory council to inform the state plan on aging well, we are um, doing additional assessments um, that Angela may have shared this piece with you last week, but that includes doing an ARP survey, 45 plus, as well as doing through the health department, um, a more, um, I would say, quanti qualitative assessment with Vermonters. Um, we are going to be working on what that tool, survey tool looks like. But we will have a chance, I think, to dig deeper than we have had before and to continue to bring back those findings and the needed next steps at the Governor's Commission for ADRD, as well as back to this group here, because we need to continue to explore um, what you're asking about in terms of how to make sure that people are where they need to be in the time they need to be. And that includes, you know, um, being able to go into long-term care when that time comes. Okay, thank you. Um, so at this point, there's not a, you don't have a capital investment plan as part of the action plan. No, we yeah. don't. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, any other specific questions for Rhonda at this point? Senator Cummings and then Senator Hooker. Yeah, it's been quite a while since I worked in the field, but at that time there was basically one treatment drug, Haldol, which was finally called vitamin H because um, almost everyone got, took it. And we're talking about prevention. We're talking... But I've heard there is a new, very expensive drug out there. Have there still is no cure, correct? There and is it, no cure, yeah. And it is a progressive disease. Is we talk about early diagnosis? I'm at that age. I don't want the diagnosis because there's nothing I can do about it. Um, and if you do the pop-up news every day, there's three different symptoms that might tell you you might be at risk of. Um, actually, one of the studies that came out said that if smoking didn't kill you, it did give you some protection against Alzheimer's. I don't know that we want to publicize that. But is there 
pharmaceutical intervention out there now that might encourage people to come forward? And because if you do get the diagnosis early, yeah, there's things you can do about your lifestyle and throw rugs Mm -hmm. and different things. But other than making it a little easier to tolerate, is there actually something that will delay the onset or delay the severity out there? I think what's um, pretty clear is that there's not yet, you know, and there may not likely be a magic bullet. That's one medication, for example. However, um, the early diagnosis gives the advantage of several things. One of which is, yes, there's adjunacana, very hard to pronounce. Um, They all are. They all are, right? But adjuhelm is the um, commercial name for it. (laughs) But adjuhelm is the one that you were referred to that is expensive and I think is, um, you know, in terms of the process for it being in the pipeline, um, recently Medicare announcing, um, that it would need to be that if a person is on the b- drug, that they're also needing to be in a, um, study at the same time, which there has been recent comments delivered to health and human services saying that, and to Medicare, sorry, that, um, that this type of, um, attach more criteria for a new drug could be a real barrier for people who can't afford the travel to participate in a study um, or may face other difficulties, live alone, may not just be able to access that type of criteria requirement. So I, so that is um, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, or CMS, is taking public comment um, on that um, regu- or proposed regulation. Um, but from what I understand is that it's important for that early detection in the, in the sense that there may be several medications that, when combined, can help an individual with, um, you know, better cognition. Um, there's also the piece around understanding the other medications that individual may be on that may be thwarting, maybe in um, needing to, to, to be looked at so that they fit the individual's needs at that stage in life. Um, and there are also, um, con- Congress has put a lot more funding in the last several years to NIH for studies to be more inclusive of uh, a range of uh, individuals, um, including for for, uh, racial and sexual identities, and also just in terms of gaining, I think, assistance and structure around if you fit this criteria, if you have a family history, for example, come into this study because you're going to be able to be supported in in knowing about what those interventions can look like in addition to to being in consultation with your own primary care provider. So I think it's a mix of things. And as a public health department through the BOLD program, we want to make that information more available so that, yes, there's no magic bullet, but there are things out there that can help delay onset and um, give people advantage. Okay, we have two more questions and then um, we're, we're probably gonna have to move on because we do wanna hear from Sean Laundergan, but both Senator Hooker and Senator Hardy have questions. And Go ahead. actually, um, your last comment, Rhonda, was a, a good segue. You talked about having the information and getting it out there. And that was my question. How easy is it for someone who's new to initially get be connected mm-hmm. to all of this information and all of this data yeah. I mean, how um you know a family that is struggling with this initially how do they connect so that they know that these resources are out there and that they can um get help somewhere yeah yeah so it's um a multi-pronged effort one is what 
we've referred to as that capacity building among primary care, because if they have the information and you're going in for another issue, but they may notice something or, or someone over time, we hope, feels more and more comfortable about talking about their memory issues that if the primary care team has the latest information, they feel you know, enabled to share it. It's also though getting uh, information out through our area agencies on aging. We're looking at how can we provide, you know, pieces of, um, you know, important key messages or, or here's where you can go for this information in, um, in those newsletters that have, from what I understand, really good dissemination in the community. We are, um, we don't have a, a lot of communication funds, but with what we do have, um, we're working with the media contractor to disseminate as broadly as we can. We know some people are online and that's what they rely on, but others are dependent on their local newspaper. And I love the Addison Independent, for example. Um, and so we need to be looking at using strategies um, so that people can access what they need and when they need it. Um, so one of the things that we are using as a measure is promoting um, the Alzheimer's helpline. You know, these are master trained individuals. They're very good. I've, I've called myself to gain more information about Alzheimer's and you can call in real time if you're struggling, if you're a caregiver and you need some support, they're there to help you. And so we wanna help promote that. Um, and 211 is another resource that uh, we're going to be meeting with 211's um, management over this winter to talk about how we can work together and getting information out as well. So those are a couple, couple of ways. And, and can I ask you if you could um, submit your written testimony? Yes. Your, you had a lot of documents, but your testimony was Yes, there. we'll you. do that. Mm -hmm. Uh, you can just send it to Aaron and he'll post it. Thank you. Senator Hardy. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Rhonda or Ms. Williams, thank you so much for your testimony. Um, I, I, I am working with our drafting attorney to uh, attempt <laughs> to redraft the bill uh, and to integrate it into what's already happening uh, in a way that's helpful. So I'm really looking at what our like the details of the language that is needed to be able to move this work forward. Um, and what I'm hearing from you is that there is a state plan um, that would be from 22 to 24. Um, and, but part of what we heard last week is that we need a state plan or maybe what we need is a permanent state plan or a different state plan. And then the question of who does that state plan, what we heard last week is that it should be integrated into the, the plan that Dale is working on for older Vermonters. Um, but it sounds like maybe you already have a plan. So I'm just trying to figure out like mm -hmm. literally drafting the language, where do we put that plan? Who should be responsible for it? How should it get done? Or is it already done? So could you help me understand that yeah. better? So when, when we, Worked with Dale, uh, so Angela and I worked on that 2018-2019 action plan that I mentioned, and it was um, also included in the state plan on aging, because we do want, right, we do want this work to mesh together so that um, public health is doing what it's, it needs to do at the same time the state plan on aging and other partners are also doing their roles. Um, I think what CDC is really trying to support in, in a state having a specific action plan on Alzheimer's and healthy aging is that it doesn't get lost. Not that, right, it's, it's such, it is a very important issue. And what I mean by getting lost is that sometimes you do need that specific targeted plan with measurable actions to kind of keep accountability and to, 
you know, for at least I'm a big fan of where are we, what's our baseline and where are we trying to go and how are we going to get there? And when are we going to know when we're going to get there and being able to communicate on that. So whether it's a standalone or whether it's, you know, in, you know, a part of another state plan document, um, I think we can certainly figure that out and what is most strategic. Um, I do know that um, with Dale, we'd really like to have some some measures that are shared and online so people can go and look and see, you know, how are we doing um, and know then where to go to ask for more information as when it comes to to these strategies we're using. So, you know, I happy to um, with our legal teams look at what may be appropriate um, in terms of the specificity that you're looking for. Yeah, it would be helpful to get some more specificity because what you just said is contradictory to what we heard from Dale. So um, if you and um, I believe it's Angela Jiang Smith yeah. could get on the same page <laughs> and tell us wh where you would like the plan to sit and who should be doing the plan and should it be a standalone plan or should it be an addendum to the older Vermonters plan or where that plan should be and what should be included in that plan um, would be really helpful because that's one of the reasons we don't have the draft, Madam Chair, is that Katie and I went around and around with this. Where should the plan be? <laughs> um, ultimately, and Senator, you're, you're absolutely right. And ultimately, the buck may end right here on our desk. So... Uh, right. And know, I'm happy yeah. to make that call or have this committee make that call. But I think the people doing the work really should should get on the same page and give us your recommendations about who and where that plan should be and what should be included in it. Because um, what you're talking about with the preventative measures that you're working on are incredibly important. And I definitely think that should all be included, plus whatever the feds are, are asking for. But what we have heard in this committee um, is that there are people right now out in Vermont who are really, really struggling to provide care to people who are living with Alzheimer's in, in their families. And then when they get to the point where they have to either be hospitalized or put in long-term care, that there's it, it's not a supported atmosphere in terms of making those decisions or providing the financial resources to be able to do so. So people run out of their Medicare lifetime, um, you know, uh, available funds, and then they're basically kicked out of wherever they are. And there's no, there's no plan for them and hospitals and families and long-term care facilities are in the lurch. And so those things need to be addressed too, in addition to the really important preventative stuff, because that's what we're hearing about literally people in crisis and not knowing what to do. So um, I'm, you, yeah. you've expressed it very well. And these are the concerns that we're hearing. Uh, and we're going to try to solve some of this through legislatively. And you've also heard, uh, Rhonda, the request for working together with um, Allison smith Jang and bringing us your, your collective recommendation. I also know that there's a report that's coming in and is it 2023 on this? And so, um, but we're writing legislation today. Uh, so any, any help that you can give us would be fully appreciated. And um, thank you. So I'm gonna suggest that we move on to our long-term care ombudsman, because we do have another bill we want to take up. And, but with great appreciation for your being here today. Thank you. Uh, so thank you too. Yeah, it's great. Um, Sean, thanks for being here. Uh, we have your testimony and it's very much directed toward 206. And why don't we spend about 10 minutes or so going through that? And then we'll have what we need to move forward. Okay, well, thank you very much for the opportunity to come um, in and provide testimony. Um, I'm Sean Lonigan, so I'm the state long-term care ombudsman. And so just quickly, um, uh, we, the long-term care um, ombudsman project is uh, uh, serves residents of um, nursing homes, uh, residential care homes, 
and assisted living residents. And we also um, assist individuals who are on long-term care, Medicaid, choices for care, and get that benefit um, in, the in a community setting. So for example, the home or adult family care home, um, as, as an example. And I wasn't totally sure what the committee was looking for. And I um, was unfamiliar with this um, le uh, proposed legislation. So I just kind of went through the legislation um, uh, and, and kind of looked at it from the VLP's perspective um, and uh, kind of outlined some of our observations. Um, and it's, um, as the uh, chairperson noted, um, I did provide that testimony um, kind of written out and I was just gonna, you know, kind of track that. And so when I was looking at it, I did read the title, you know, act relating to planning for care and treatment of patients with cognitive impairments. And then I noted the purposes of the, of the bill and they're all clear. Um, but I guess when I was looking at this, I, you know, was, I guess the first thing it was, you know, when you mentioned cognitive impairments, that's pretty broad. And then I was just, um, as, I, as we were going through it, it did seem as though um, the, the legislation is, is, is not quite as broad as I was assuming, given the title. And that's not an issue. I was just, again, coming from it from a perspective of not really um, being totally unfamiliar with the legislation, uh, proposed legislation, and then kind of thinking about, you know, what we observed. And so I did note that the production of an assessment and a plan is limited to Alzheimer's disease. Um, and um, then, but then, you know, then I saw the cognitive impairments and that's um, cognitive impairments that that term is only really used in section two when it's talking about continuing um, educational requirements um, for um, like doctors, physician assistants um, and those sorts. Uh, so kind of like an, an acute medical setting. Um, and then um, again, the kind of like, it does seem as though the disclosure and, uh, of diagnosis and treatment plans pertains only to a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease and limited to just like a family member or agent. Um, and then the requirement of, the, of a hospital plan is limited to patients with dementia or delirium. Um, so I guess those are just kind of the things that um, we observed. And, um, and then, so then going to section two, um, well, section one, excuse me, which talks about, again, um, the accretion of production of a um, assessment um, and a plan that's limited to kind of Alzheimer's disease. And these are maybe just nitpicky things, but um, I, we were just wondering like, what is meant by a state plan to overcome Alzheimer's disease? And I only mentioned this because I've been like, uh, the VLP has been part of many task force or working groups. Um, when um, that come out of legislation and there's many times where we, you know, uh, the, the group maybe initially gets stuck on, you know, words. And it, so it does seem to me that like overcome is kind of a, I don't, I don't necessarily um, totally um, understand what that term is and that's not really an issue, but it does seem as though the legislation proposed does lay, lay out like concrete and distinct requirements um, for the plan. And it seems as though it's kind of, um, um, the purpose of those uh, requirements is to comprehens comprehensively address Alzheimer's disease. And uh, Rhonda Williams had mentioned about prevention, and I did see terms about preventing halt. So again, I don't know whether or not um, these are just minor things um, potentially, but there was just kind of things that stuck out in our mind. And um, again, um, the, then going on to section two, which talks about uh, continuing education requirements. Um, and then, so that's where the word cognitive impairments is, is mentioned and it includes Alzheimer's disease and dementia. So that's more expansive. Um, and, it, and I guess, you know, since we, the ombudsman program work with residents, um, uh, we see that, you know, in this leg proposed legislation, like um, it's kind of um, limited to uh, patients. And I realize doctors, um, uh, serve patients and all the individuals listed here, all professions, nurses, registered nurses, um, nursing assistants, um, they all probably would um, potentially address or view the people that they serve as pa patients. But there are like um, individuals that care um, for um, individuals in facilities and th those are residents. And so again, I don't know whether or not these um, requirements 
um, would only um, would kind of um, a, 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 um, apply to individuals that are, you know, serving residents of long-term care facilities, such as nursing homes, residential care homes, and assisted living. The federal um, requirements, uh, uh, regulations do um, have a requirement that, you know, uh, nursing home staff get training on things like dementia, um, but, you know, that's not necessarily uh, true across the board in, in the sense of uh, residential care homes, assisted living, um, uh, residences. So again, I, when I see the word patients, um, that's more, that does not, in my mind, always include residents. So from a, our perspective, you know, we're advocates for residents. So that's something that kind of popped up uh, in our mind. And then D, um, disclosure and treatment options. Um, uh, again, I guess maybe in reading this, um, we, where the VOP, um, resident directed, um, meaning that we don't move forward unless we get consent from residents um, to do anything, right? If they have an issue or concern, we don't go forward unless, you know, the resident's able to give us consent or they have an individual who is kind of um, their uh, legal representative and we can take direction from them. So I think consent of the patient um, to disclose a diagnosis um, obviously um, is, is very important. So I, I think that's great. Um, I guess our, 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 one of the things that we um, uh, looked at like implied consent um, and what, you know, what, 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 what would implied consent be, you know, is it defined or um, are there any examples of what, um, um, you know, implied consent would, would, would mean? And so again, that's only because for, again, from our perspective, um, we're resident directed, so consent um, uh, is is a big uh, is a big thing. And then the hospitals, um, and I was just we were just also wondering about as a physician, um, do they just? I mean, I would, in our experience, um, uh, in facilities, um, there is a treatment plan, a care plan um, that the residents are supposed to uh, are active participants in. Um, you know, ideally, I'm not saying this happens all the time, but that's kind of the idea, like a resident directed uh, plan of care. So I was just wondering if physicians um, don't already do this in the sense of um, if there's a diagnosis um, and the, the, the patient is included in that, um, I don't know whether or not they, I would think maybe that in that situation, and when the doctor's talking with uh, um, his or her patient, that they're kind of discussing this and saying, you know, are there individuals that you that you want to be part of of your you know your treatment plan and your care? Um, and so um, uh, that was just something that we um, noted. And then the last thing, the hospital hospital operational plan, um, the VOP would think that's very important for hospitals to have. And, uh, to implement an operational plan for uh, recognition and management of patients. Again, um, we would maybe expand it to, you know, cognitive impairments, um, including dementia and delirium, um, um, because we get many calls um, from in, about individuals with cognitive impairments that are, you know, kind of like stuck in hospitals um, and they, they need long-term care um, and, um, but they, they can't find a place to go. And that's you know, a complex issue. Um, but since there's so many um, individuals, and again, we get, we get calls. And so you know, my perspective of the issue could be different in the sense of the extent of it. Um, but we do get um, you know, a significant amount of calls where individuals, um, again, are needing long-term care. They're in hospitals and hospitals are you know, not designed to, put, to, um, to provide long-term care services and support. So in our view, it's not like a really appropriate place for an individual that maybe needs nursing home level of care, you know, to be stuck at a hospital and not be able to get somewhere else. So if that's actually happening, it would be really important for hospitals to have a plan um, so that they can, you know, address this issue and do it in a, in a, in a way in which, you know, patients there are, are better off than you know if they're just there and and, and there's no plan. Um, so um, again, I, again, when maybe we might expand this to you know all cognitive impairments, um, including dementia and delirium. So 
uh, again, I don't know if this is helpful at all, but that was kind of our perspective in, in thinking about how to, you know, um, come here today and give you some, maybe some feedback in terms of, again, our perspective, looking at proposed legislation and, and you know, all these things are great. Um, we, we wouldn't not support these things. We just have, you know, questions about um, how, how it's the wording. And again, we may look into words too much and it's, you know, but that was just our perspective. Uh, Sean, thank you so much. Um, I, I, you know, we're, we are short on time, but if there's a quick question, um, let's, let's do that. Okay. Senator Cummings. I think you're mute. Working on it. There it goes. It was being <laughs> stubborn. Um, Sean, you've been at this a, a long time and I'm getting the impression right now for when in doubt plan, because everybody seems to be planning. Um, and we're trying to make the plans go in the right direction. But if there was one thing we could do that we could change today that would make life better, easier for either dementia patients or their caregivers, what would that be? Yeah, I, I do think that planning is important, right? Because when yep. you know, if it if doesn't happen up front and these things aren't discussed, um, and then you get to a point where everything is a crisis, right? So then you wind up at the hospital and you're trying to run around trying to find a place um, to to go because you know things have reached a crisis point. So um, I don't know if I'm answering, but it has to be planning, and maybe it is changing that perspective. So uh, Rhonda had mentioned um, the uh, the fact of kind of like. Um, making it easier uh, for people to talk about these issues and not feel um, that, you know, they're placing them, themselves in jeopardy or they're, you know, kind of going to end up somewhere they don't want to be. So this happens, I, I guess, long-term care is not something that people think about until either they have a loved one that needs it or that they themselves are, have reached a point where they, they think they need it. So I do, and it's so up until that point, people don't really think about it and it's really complicated. So to jump right into it, when there's a crisis or a need, it's too late. So I do think it's kind of a changing a mindset of, <laughs> of kind of like being able to talk about these things, plan accordingly and make it easier, right? So it, um, it is a convoluted process and so I do think that we have to kind of get on things earlier and be more preventive um, than kind of responding to crisis. And um, we kind of do that overall, right? And, and, and many things in our society, we respond to crises is not very good at maybe planning up front. So I guess that would be my answer is that we just need to plan better and realize that this is an issue that's gonna affect either ourselves or someone that we care about. And it's better to get out in front of these things than to try to, catch up after the fact. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you for that. I mean, as you're mentioning prevention, and, and we're going to end here, but as you're mentioning prevention, it goes in a couple of different directions. One is the individual and preventing the onset of these uh, debil debilitating diseases, but the other is a systemic prevention so that we have a system of coordinated continuity of care and people know where and how to access the level of care that they need. So I think you've expressed that very well. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, so committee, uh, unfortunately, uh, not unfortunately, we, we've, we've heard some very good things today. And I think this is going to help us go through S206 and make it better. Um, so we're going to move on to S198, which is the bill of for, and thank you, Sean, for being thank here you. with us. Appreciate Thank you for it. Your invitation. Yeah. Bye bye. Great. Um, so we're going to move on. So Aaron, we have folks coming in to the from the waiting room, and S one ninety eight is um, Rosa went through the bill with us previously, and so now we're looking at what is the need for a, a working group for the diaper distribution system of diaper distribution. And we know that we helped with that last, I forget when it started, but we put money into the, into the diapers going to the food bank and being distributed in that way. And then folks have raised the issue around how do we make this sustainable? 
So we have two people in to testify with us. Our uh, Charity, welcome. And Amanda, welcome. Do you have coordinated testimony? Or do you want to yes. just... Okay. Thank, thank you, Madam I'll Chair. Turn it, I'll turn it over to you to introduce yourselves for the record, and we look forward to it. Thank you very much for having us. I am Charity Clark. I'm normally here in my professional capacity, but today I'm here in my personal capacity as a sustainer and volunteer with the Junior League of Champlain Valley Diaper Bank. And with me is Amanda Hertzberger, who is um, also with the Junior League. She's our co-chair of the Diaper Bank Committee. Um, and what, what we'll do, and especially given the, the time crunch today, is I'll provide just a brief background and overview, and Amanda will have more detail um, about uh, the diaper bank and, and what we're up to and what we're looking for. So first, you might be wondering what the Junior League is. The Junior League is basically an organization of women who volunteer together. And about four years ago, when I was president of the Junior League, we um, started thinking about starting a diaper bank and wondering if there was a need. We heard from Feeding Chittenden, which is the food shelf in Burlington, that they were receiving every day five to eight inquiries about diapers that they didn't have. There was no mechanism to distribute diapers formally to uh, food shelves. There's no safety net from the government for diapers. You can't get diapers with food stamps. There's no diapers with WIC. There's no way to get people diapers other than just people donating them. So occasionally there would be diapers, but there was no real mechanism. So we launched this diaper bank in the Champlain Valley, which is our kind of region. And that's a whole other saga that I could describe, but I wanna fast forward to uh, the, the pandemic. So the model that, that we had and still have is that we um, have a basically a warehouse in South Burlington and we get these diapers to food shelves and parent child centers. And that's how the diapers get to the people who need them. In the pandemic, we, like all of us, were incredibly moved to see the increase in need, to see those lines of cars, to get supplies and food. And we were, um, were challenged and moved and called to stretch ourselves to be statewide. We're an organization that's just in Champlain Valley and basically the greater Burlington area. And we decided now is the time that we answer this call and we work to provide this, um, these supplies of diapers to families in need across the state. And that's what we did in large part um, with help from the legislature who donated or donated, who made financial um, support to us and enabled us to buy diapers. Um, notice I say buy diapers because we are truly 100% volunteer organization. And I can't think of another example of an essential service being provided statewide to Vermont families by a 100% volunteer organization. Not one penny goes to paying a person to do anything. This is just something we, we literally do in our spare time, um, which is tremendous. And I'm very proud of the work that we have done, but, but of course it's not really sustainable in the long term. And indeed, probably around the end of this year, we will run out of the money that we got from the legislature and we will have to scale back to being the way we were before, which is getting diapers from donations, um, you know, boxes at the grocery store and diaper drives and things like that. And, and that will be just in Chittenden County basically. And so the rest of Vermont will be going without diapers. That brings us to why we're here today. We 100% volunteer organization are truly experts on running a diaper bank and probably not experts on government systems, capacities, structures, and what the best way of providing um, diapers to people in need in Vermont might look like. And so we're here advocating for this working group to get the stakeholders together and devise a system of doing just that and making sure that um, babies, toddlers, and families in Vermont have the diapers that they need. So that's the rough overview. And Amanda has an incredible amount of knowledge about this and can speak um, more specifically to, um, to this issue. Thank you, Charity, I appreciate it. Um, yeah, Charity gave a good overview of sort of our bank and what we have accomplished so far. And I just wanted to um, step back one step and just define diaper need because a lot of people are not fully aware of the issue. And basically diaper need is a lack of a sufficient supply. So it's wanting to change baby's diaper 
but not being able to because you don't have a supply of diapers, you can't afford diapers. Um, you might have to keep your child in diapers longer than you might want to, which leads to health consequences. And then also um, you can't drop your child off at daycare if you do not have a supply of diapers to drop off with your child. So it also prevents folks from being able to go to work if they do not have the ability to afford enough diapers to drop off with their child. So it's a very, um, it's in a way an easy to understand issue, but it's also a really difficult issue to imagine the stress um, that might come with, with those decisions. So as Charity mentioned, we started off four years ago very um, realistically, I would say, and wanting to distribute about 100,000 diapers just in Chittenden and Franklin County, which was kind of our scope in the Champlain Valley. And with COVID, um, and as she mentioned, we did receive some money, $50,000 from the legislature in 2020 and $82,000 in 2021. So just to give you a sense of our growth, we distributed $98,000 in 2000, or 98,000 diapers in 2019. Then in 2020, with our expansion to statewide, that grew to 458,000 diapers. And last year, that grew again to 824,000 diapers, as Charity said, all done through volunteer, through the money with the legislature, and also through working with Jason Fitzgerald, D physical therapy, and some donations from seventh generation. So the need is there and we are serving these families, but we are not able to continue doing it at this level. It's just not possible. Um, and so I just wanted to, you know, Cherry spoke to the idea of doing the working group and trying to bring stakeholders to the table over these four years. We've really spoken to anyone we can think of in Vermont that might help us find a solution. We've spoken to um, the Food Bank, Parent Child Centers, Building Bright Futures, WIC, um, the Department of Health, UVM, but basically anyone that we can think of. And what we found is that there's really not a consensus on what a sustainable program in Vermont will look like that would be able to continue to provide diapers to families. And so that's why we feel like a working group would be an effective way to do that, to bring stakeholders to the table and to get everyone um, talking about this important issue. And, you know, as Sherry said, we are very expert in running our bank. We have great operations now, but we, we've learned a little bit about the systems in Vermont and the systems that are available. We don't um, we're not experts in it. And so we're really hoping to utilize people who do have that knowledge and expertise to find a solution for families. And one thing that I did um, with the testimony on Friday, and I just wanted to speak to the um, question about cloth diapers that came up. And it's certainly an important issue. And the reality is about 95% of families in the US rely on disposable diapers. And I think it's really important to separate the environmental concern with the concern of just getting these diapers to families we need. It's it's certainly an important thing to talk about, but I don't think we should be um, solving the environment concern on the back of families who don't have access to diapers. And there are issues around um, uh, accessibility to laundering facilities. Some laundering facilities do not allow diapers to be laundered in public facilities. And many of the families that we serve do not have um, access to their own private washing facilities. So we certainly believe it could be an important part of the process, the solution, and we'd love for it to be a part of the solution, but we don't necessarily feel that it's realistic for the families that we serve to have it be the main part of the solution. And we, we do really think it's important to separate those two issues um, while believing that both are very important. Um, and Charity, is there anything that you can think of that I'm missing? I was just going to highlight that we did um, put kind of a, a mock, not a, it's not a mock up, it's real, but uh, the written testimony that we submitted has a couple of attachments. One is just testimonials from the parent child centers and, or some of the parent child centers and uh, food shelves we serve. But the second is an actual basic budget on how much the diapers cost. Um, we thought that would be useful for you. It's by size and you can see how much they, they cost per size. And then you can see um, a monthly and an annual, just to give you a rough idea. Obviously there's no overhead or anything like that included um, in that budget, but just so you can see how much the actual diapers cost. We are a member of the National Diaper Bank Network. And through that, we have a lot of resources um, that make it uh, uh, con not convenient, cheaper for us to buy diapers. Um, so that might go into your calculus. It's not like if you went to the grocery store and tried to buy diapers, you could get them for this great price that we get. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yes. Um, so 
I guess one of the very early questions that the committee had was, why do we need to have legislation for this working group? I mean, can't you guys go out and sort of figure this out, sort out the issues and come to some resolution? I, I mean, that would be that would be great. And we certainly have tried that um, over the past few years. Amanda mentioned all of the different folks that we've spoken to about this. Um, and, and keep in mind, I'm, I'm sure that this is probably unique uh, before your committee. We're truly just volunteers. So we're, when we're meeting with people during the day, you know, we're taking time out of our, our work. We don't have an executive director to advocate. We don't, we don't have anyone other than the volunteers. So that's part of the dynamic here. But we have spoken to all of the folks we think would be on the working on a working group. Okay. So uh, and so then, Amanda, did you want to add anything there? Yeah, I think what Charity said is correct. Um, you know, we've we have tried. Um, you know, we've had conversations with, as I said, everyone we can think of, and it just doesn't seem like um, the solution is clear. And one, a few options to think about, and actually one thing I did want to mention as was confirmed on Friday is that sales tax, that's often a low hanging fruit. Um, sales tax is not char currently charged on tours and not. So thankfully that's already not an issue. But some of the programs that we've thought about and one option is in California, they do offer a $30 stipend for the CalWORKs program, which is somewhat similar to the reach up program for families who are trying to get back to work to buy diapers. So, you know, thinking of possible solutions, one solution could be sort of an additional money on an EBT card. It could be a standalone um, diaper bank. It could be through WIC. Um, as, as we've said, we don't know, we don't have the full understanding of these programs. And so we don't, um, we're experts at a bank, but we don't know what the, what the solution will be necessarily. So what we're hearing then is uh, a couple of things. One, to have some system in place, whether or not it's attached to eligibility requirements or not, and then a system for accessing the dollars needed to continue to buy diapers for everyone in the state. And then the distribution of those, because now you're doing that uh, through food banks, I think principally. So um, so you've got three or four different places to look and then how, how to build that coordinated system and who's in charge. It's like, um, it's complex. <laughs> but, well, you know, it is, and it isn't. I mean, it seems to me that you've been supporting you, you volunteers have been supporting a system, uh, during the pandemic and during the crisis. Uh, so for me, I say, how can we continue the system that's here? And then you you gave us a you gave us a budget. Um, where does that money come from? I mean, are you still looking to do have find seventh generation and other don donors? Uh, what how's that going to sort? Yeah, out? I mean, we continue as we work to look for a solution. We do you do um, you know write grants to be in touch with seventh generation to see if those donations are available to us and continue to run diaper drives but what we're finding is that while well, those things felt possible when we were distributing a hundred thousand diapers a year those are quickly becoming improbable when we are distributing sixty thousand diapers ish a month um, and the scale is just not something that we, as volunteers writing these grants, securing these donations, um, making these calls to try to figure out a solution. It's just above and beyond what we are able to do. Yet we do feel very deeply that a solution is possible and that there should be one. So it's, um, that's kind of where we are right now. Okay, so it sounds also like um, you might be looking for a more formal uh, structure. I'm the, my question is, is it in your thinking to have an executive director? Because I think you mentioned that you don't have a, an executive director and you're not spending money for um, the, the human resources. So are you thinking to continue to be volunteer? Is that something open for discussion? I mean, I, I think it's probably open for discussion. We had never, I don't think we really entertain the idea of continuing as a statewide diaper bank in, in part because the junior league is, we're not supposed to be beyond our kind of area. Yeah. Um, 
So I don't think we'd ever seriously thought about doing that for, for our league. Um, you know, the, there's all part of the conversation, surely if there's a, a working, a working group, but um, yeah, that's not something we'd really seriously considered. Okay. Um, Senator Hardy, you have a question. Um, yeah, I, I have a question and then I have a few ideas. Um, so one question, Amanda and Charity, first of all, thank you for your testimony and for all of your amazing hours of volunteering to help get diapers to people during the pandemic. That's incredible. So thank you for that. Um, you said you're part of the na national diaper bank and that's what gives you these cheap prices for diapers. Is that something that would transfer to another organization or if there were a bunch of organizations that were distributing the diapers, would there still need to be a central hub that was a member to get the cheap prices on diapers? Um, yes, it is a membership based organization. Yes, somebody else could, you know, an, another entity could apply to be a part of that. Um, one of the things that we've taken advantage of is when you buy in bulk, the price goes down. And so the prices that we quoted are because uh, yesterday we purchased 16 pallets worth of diapers. And so, you know, it, it provides, you know, it's, it's, it's one of the questions to think about the working group. Obviously, when you um, centralize it, you have maybe one hub of diapers being distributed state, you know, to different sub hubs in the state, then you get to take advantage of that purchasing power, but it's a cost benefit of whether it's worth, uh, there is the possibility of doing that. Um, it seems unlikely that, you know, 50 organ different organizations would all be members of National Diaper Bank and all be taking advantage of that, but that's not to say that one central one couldn't be and then, you know, kind of turn out through the state. Okay. Um, Cause it seems to me, I mean, I said Friday and I still agree that I, I don't think this is something that we need a working group on. People are overwhelmed with working groups. We've created so many working groups over the last couple of years um, that people are just burnt on working groups. We also have, I mean, literally on Friday, we passed a bill that had money in it for um, parent child centers. This morning, we passed a bill on the floor that had money in it for the food bank. Um, these are organizations that we're already providing support to, and if they are the organizations that are helping get diapers out to people, it seems to me that we just put in a line that says part of what you do with this money is help distribute diapers. This is actually cheap. These are rounding mm -hmm. errors. The, the money for these diapers are rounding errors in the appropriations that we're already giving these organizations. And um, if there's one central, maybe it's the food bank that can be a member of the diaper bank nationally and get the cheap prices, then all these other organizations can continue to distribute them with the funds that we're already providing and also childcare centers and schools and also providing the ability to, for families to get it either through reach up or through uh, three squares Vermont. It, it just doesn't seem like it doesn't seem like it rises to a, a, a working group that includes the secretary and of AHS and various other high level officials. Um, maybe the, the current secretary has changed a diaper, but the previous one, I'm not sure he's changed a diaper in a really long time. So oh, no. <laughs> I thought um, we'll, we'll, we'll ask him somewhere. <laughs> so anyway, I just wanna make sure that the people who are actually doing the work are part of the solution and that if we're providing money for all these organizations, we just say, hey, you need to also provide diapers and, um, and not create a whole other bureaucracy and organization and executive director of diapers, et cetera. So if I could- Go ahead, Charity. I, I really appreciate that, um, Senator Hardy, and it makes me excited to think about skipping the working group and just getting right to the, the fixing. That's awesome. Um, and I'll let these organizations speak, speak for themselves, but I did want to relay something Amanda and I heard in speaking with some of these stakeholders was a concern that they wouldn't, they're already doing what they can with the money that they have and didn't want to have an extra like, you know, burden of providing diapers unless there was resources attached to that expectation. So I would just pass that on and they can speak for themselves. But we certainly did hear that when we met with people. Uh, any other questions? 
uh, Senator Terangini. Yeah, thanks, Senator Lyons. I uh, I like I liked what Senator Hardy had to say about not creating more bureaucracy. Uh, I certainly don't want to see see that happen, but I do love the idea of um, you know what what you uh, Amanda and Charity are doing and stand for and work so hard for. Um, you know, and I think we could. I'd love to see us forget about the working group and find some money just to support the organization. You know, we just, I don't know, what would we get about $2 billion uh, in ARPA money? Let's go find some money and buy some diapers and get it done. That, that's sort of my opinion and approach. So those are my two cents, Senator Lyons. I leave it in your hands to find the money. <laughs> well, we, we may be able to do that, but then once you, uh, just a comment and then Senator Hooker and Senator Cummings each have comments or questions. Mm -hmm. Once you do that this year and we find money this year, then you have a continuing ongoing need the next year and the year after that. And this year we're talking about 458,000 diapers. And next year we might be talking about 525,000 diapers. And you need to have in place a way for uh, access and distribution. So it's not I, just the money. Yeah, I know. I get it. I understand. Yeah. And none of us wants to add on to the bureaucracy, but we do want to make sure that there's a system, a continuing system in place. That, that's all. And, and I totally agree. And I, and I understand that my response was, uh, yeah, you know, a little bit it. fun, right? But no, my, well, point get is, it. my point is there, you know, we should be able to build some type of a pipeline with all the resources we utilize in the state to help other agencies and people of need and so on. Uh, I couldn't think of a more worthy cause um, to help out those who can't necessarily afford good quality diapers for their children. Uh, you know, I'm, my wife and I are lucky to be able to with our little kids, but not everyone can. So I, I think this will be a noble purpose for us to figure out a way to build a pipeline to support this for years to come. Thank you, uh, Senator Hooker. And I just want to follow up on that, Senator Lyons, that, um, you know, I'd love to see this put in place immediately so that we didn't have to go through a working group. But there is a need for some kind of organization at, at the top. And I hesitate to say the top, um, whether it's a director um, that oversees this whole concept of either purchasing and distribution. But it seems to me that we have the scaffolding in place certainly with the food banks and the parent child centers and all of that and so there is probably a need to get together and talk about how we're going to um, formalize this system and i agree certainly with senator hardy said the other day about you know this is a, a large working group do we need all of these people involved does it need to be as expansive as the bill suggests and what can we do to make it more efficient and put it into place sooner. Senator Cummings. I, I'm going to echo what the chair said and fulfill the ant at the picnic reputation of money committees. ARPA funding, I'm not sure diapers will qualify. Um, I, I don't know, probably, but ARPA funding is one-time funding. And to find the funding for, and, and two years out, our revenue growth rate is forecast to be 0.8%. Um, and our expenses, mostly personnel and debt service are gonna grow larger than that. Um, that's now that could change. But the basic economy of Vermont is, and I think we've got the infrastructure. I mean, we've got parent-child, we've got daycares, we've got the food bank. What we need is money. Um, if we gave the food bank money, I they could join the National Diaper Bank and they could put diapers on their shelves. And the parent-child centers could pick them up and distribute them. I don't, you know, and there are other organizations that could do that. Um, I don't think we can add them to WIC without, that's a federal program. Um, we probably need to do some work um, 
at the federal level to expand WIC. Um, and for anyone that objects to including diapers, I suggest that we have the experience I have had of hauling a diaper pail full of very stinky bleach water down the hill to a washing machine. I would not risk it, you know, wish it on my worst enemy. Um, it's a wonderful experience. And, I, you know, I think we just need to, to focus on what do we really need? If we're going to do what the Junior League has done, which is raise money and buy these diapers and do, you know, fundraising events, that's one thing. If we're just talking about buying diapers, it's where do we get the money to buy the diapers and put them where we know they'll get distributed. And maybe we just task one person, like a secretary, to do that, and they'll distribute it down through their organization. Are, are, we, are we invite John Sales in and, and ask him to? Well, first thing we, we need we to know is what's him. it, it going to cost? Yeah. We will invite him. My, my it, question. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, Senator. Go ahead. No, I think that I mean, I I think we can do it. We just have to find the money. So um, and it is an ongoing expense. So oh, I'm yeah. going to ask uh, another. Uh, it, I hope will be the last or next to last. Um, so if the. Junior League of Champlain Valley uh, was reverted to its its current uh, task of providing diapers within the Champlain Valley rather than across the state as you've been doing. Then would you um, and it were linked in with our food banks? I'm trying to figure out how all this would would happen. I mean, it could theoretically go diapers could go to the state food bank, and then Junior League could be in charge of the Champlain Valley area, and then maybe parent-child centers for other areas would be distributing in those areas. Is that something that you folks have considered? Um, I don't think we've considered that specifically. I would, I'd, I'd want to talk to John Sales, who I know obviously would know probably have great ideas about what the best mechanism would be. I, I would just add that because of, um, because of the nature of being 100% volunteer, we, we have found we get a very favorable reception wherever we go and people are always helping us. We have a sweetheart lease. P people are always you know donating, pitching in their time. And so I, that's just a unique dynamic that I don't necessarily would be happening if we were a different kind of organization. You know, people sort of really take us in. Um, so keep that in mind when you're thinking of like a, us playing a structure that that's a unique dynamic that would probably just be exclusive to us. Okay. But if you were working in conjunction with food banks and parent child centers in your own areas. Yeah. I mean, that's what we do now. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I think that, um, the demand in Chittenden County is certainly the largest demand in the state. And so I think even, um, even just falling back to supply in Chittenden County would probably be more than we are able to commit to on a long-term basis, given that we are um, a small group of volunteers. So it, okay. I think we would see ourselves more in a supporting volunteer role with somebody else running it and then us offering volunteer support versus us being part of the managerial or whatever you want to call it um, structure of the solution. Okay, thank you. Uh, Senator Hardy, question. Yeah, I mean, I just go back to the, we, we've already provided a lot of these organizations money and a lot of them have ongoing appropriations and, and this isn't that much money. It really is not compared to the amount of money we're giving organizations, even in their regular budgets beyond the ARPA money. So just saying you're using this also to provide diapers, um, I, I think is totally feasible. Um, but um, Madam Chair, could we just get John Sales to come in and testify and talk to him about, because it seems to me that if well, there's one organization that could just be the sort of diaper slash food bank, it would be them. 
And um, um, so getting his thoughts would be helpful. Um, and I, the final comment I'll make is if we pay everyone a living wage and help them support their families through um, a fair taxation system and uh, all that, then there's less of a need for the, uh, uh, donated diapers because families will be able to afford them. Well said. Um, so I think uh, Charity and uh, Amanda, you mentioned uh, talking with John Sales and I would welcome your communication with him. Uh, but as we go forward, that might be that he will be the next person that we bring in, but it would be helpful if you would reach out to him and maybe give him an update of what you're hearing here. And then uh, we will also reach out and have him in when we go through S-198 uh, next time. So I think you've heard some of the concerns that we have about, you know, going through a whole working group process. It would be great if we could uh, just end the discussion here uh, and, you know, make, make something happen through our, uh, a different policy and um, appropriation. So, but, you know, you, you've raised, You've raised a big issue <laughs> and we don't, we know that there's inflation going on right now and that people can't afford to buy disposable diapers the way they we have in the past. It's just, it's unconscionable what's going on right now with the inflation. So anyway, um, Senator Cummings, did you have a quick no, question? I was just going to say, we should probably ask John Sales to give us his take on how a program would work using his organization so yeah. he can be prepared when he comes in. Oh yeah, we'll do that. Yeah. We'll do that. Anything else on S198? I, I just want to say how appreciative I am of the work that you all ha have done and continue to do. And I have... I have every uh, understanding of the, the boots on the ground that you've had to have in place and the people you've had to connect with. And uh, it's just unbelievable. So thank you for your work, particularly during the pandemic, but I know it goes way beyond that. It's the four years of uh, volunteer work is just not an easy um, burden. And we greatly appreciate the time and we will continue to work on this. We want to come up with a solution uh, in the short, short term rather than go to a longer term working group process. So help us get there, please. We'll do our we best. Would Thank be, you very much. <laughs> yeah, right. we would be happy to. We love hearing that. So thanks so oh, much for good. having us today. Senator Thanks. Cummings, last comment. I'm going to put in my pitch. In Toronto, <laughs> when my grandson was born, they recycled diapers. Can we look into that? Uh, do you we, have any knowledge of that? I mean, charity or? We do have some knowledge about that. We had a, we have a, we have a couple of environmentalists in our, among, in our midst. I myself cloth diapered and another um, a, a fellow junior league member cloth diapered and gave us some information about compostable diapers, but there's, there's more, um, there is more information to those. And they, they do sound a little cumbersome and impractical for, you know, someone who might be struggling in other parts of their yeah, lives. No, these were regular diapers. I don't know what they had to remove, but he thought it was the greatest thing since sliced bread. <laughs> they <Well>. were composted. <laughs> If you have information about that, that you have researched, you know, please send it along. I'll, I'll send it to we'll Aaron. See what we, maybe we need a working group on how to compost diapers. <laughs> I know that. I know we would all. We oh, would the all press would that. love that. <laughs> Senator Hardy, I'm I'm share that you. one, Ginny. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Okay. Thank you both for being here. And yeah, I think you. that we could.